Uh, good to be with you all. My name is Reverend John Vaughn. I'm the Executive Vice President at Auburn Seminary here in New York. Thank you very much. Um, so I am, I'm going to ask my, when they, when I ask them a few questions, they're going to introduce themselves, but Crystal Walthall with the, who's the Executive Director of Faith in New York. Clap. <laughs> Lev Meritz Nelson, who's the Director of Rabbinic Training at Truach. All right, so this is the why the faith community and what can we do? So those are going to be the, those are going to be the main points that we'll hit on. And we're going to try something a tad bit different. So we're going to, we're going to chat among ourselves, but then about partway through, we're going to open it up for a few questions or comments from the floor. So we may need some microphone help to move some stuff around. Then we'll go back, ask some questions. We'll see what the time is like if we can open back up to the floor and then we'll close up with some questions. So it's good to be here. Let me just say a word about um, Auburn and how Auburn comes to this. This last year we celebrated our 200th anniversary um, out of, I know, from uh, Auburn, New York to New York City. And the uh, focus of our work is to equip leaders of faith and moral courage for multi-faith movements for justice. But in the last year, we've been working with Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta and the Temple in Atlanta to catalyze a national faith-rooted response to mass incarceration. Because our sense is that we as a faith community as a whole have not found our voice on this issue. We have not found our voice. We're beginning to find our voices, but we haven't, we haven't found it yet. And so we've been, uh, so we did a conference this past summer in Atlanta, expected a couple hundred people, got over a thousand folks, some folks who actually, some folks are here in the room who were down there for the conference. And we're, we're, we're looking at ways to increase the visibility of, or how do faith communities increase their own visibility around working on this issue. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about some of that as we get into these, into our questions today. All right, so with that, who are you and why are you here? Crystal. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. <laughs> hey. <laughs> so again, my name is Crystal Walthall. I am the executive director of Faith in New York. So exciting. If you don't know about Faith in New York, Faith in New York is an interfaith social justice grassroots organizing organization in New York City. We are the New York City affiliate of Faith in Action National Network, formerly known as PICO National Network, which is the largest grassroots organizing faith-based organization in the country. Say that five times fast. Um, what brings me here this morning is a couple of things. One, I have to say thank you to UJA for inviting me to be here. Um, UJA has also been supporting the work of Faith in New York through our voting reform work. And I wholeheartedly believe that the changes that we make in voting reform and making voting more accessible in community is also a part of changing the narrative of mass incarceration in our country. So, you know, big shout out to UJA for that. Um, what also brings me here is being a New York City native, being a native of Brooklyn. I am proud, 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 proud Brooklyn. <laughs> and being someone who is, who has seen this firsthand, who has seen it in my community, who has seen it with my people, um, I want to end this. This has to, this has to stop. Um, I, prior to being the executive director of Faith in New York and coming into Faith in New York in, um, the nonprofit world. I was also a New York City high school teacher. So I taught US history. So um, just seeing the experience of my students, seeing my own personal experience, the lives of my friends and family, it brings me here. And I think the more that we have these conversations, particularly as people of faith, the more we can move the needle and really end this traumatic, terrible system in our country. So Great. Thank you. thank you. All right, love. So who, who are you and why are you here? So I'm Rabbi Lev Marowitz Delson. I'm at True Ah, the Rabbinic Call for Human Rights. We're a network of 2,000 rabbis and cantors across the country who organize on human rights issues. 
Um, I'd say I'm here for two reasons. One is uh, our first North American campaign was on torture. And uh, then eventually our partners on torture evolved to start working on solitary confinement as a form of torture. And so we went along with our partners in the field. And then Mike Brown was killed in Ferguson. And we have a board member in, in St. Louis, Rabbi Susan Talvey, who was deeply involved and deeply in relationship with the activists in Ferguson. And we said, Susan, what do you need? And she said, wait, don't come yet. It's not the right time. And we waited and we supported. And then at a certain point she said, now come. This is when the, the activists on the ground need clergy from around the country to be here on the streets. And so we went. I didn't myself go personally. I had a two-year-old at the time. Um, but many of our rabbis in Kansas across the country were there. And that started us on a journey of uh, taking on mass incarceration as an issue, of organizing rabbis and cantors to organize their communities on it. And then from there, understanding that really racism is at the bottom of all of it, and trying to work on how we teach Jewish communities um, to think about racism, to talk about racism, to take steps to fight and end racism. Thanks, Lev. So I'm, I'm going to start with you, is this question about kind of the religious text, the values, what are the practices that really animate, that animate your work, that animate your call to this work? Great. So I want to lift up three. Um, and one actually Rabbi Auerbach spoke about a little bit in her uh, piece, which was tshuva. Right? So we believe that, uh, that repentance is always possible. And so we should be setting up systems where if somebody does something wrong, commits a harm against society, um, that that person has opportunities to right that wrong and to be reintegrated and not just punished and punished and punished and punished. Um, the second one I would lift up is Salam Elohim, the image of God. Uh, and Rabbi Creditor mentioned this very briefly in his introduction, but we believe from the very beginning of Genesis that God creates humanity in God's own image. And what that means is that everybody has dignity and human rights that are inherent. It doesn't matter if, if they've done something wrong or they haven't done something wrong. Um, when you're locking up those two plus million people, uh, those are images of God that are locked up in cages. And then the third one is, um, I guess what I would call fellowship. So in Deuteronomy, when the Torah is talking about the laws of um, the criminal justice and of punishment, it says that uh, you, um, if someone has, has committed a wrong and, and deserves lashes, they can get up to 40 lashes, um, so that your brother does not become dis debased or disgraced in your eyes. And that reminder, we, it's so easy in American society to think about someone who's committed a crime or is alleged, or accused of a crime, um, as the other, as that bad person over there. We don't have anything to do with them. But in fact, they're our siblings. They're part of our community. Um, and when we can remember that, when we can teach the rest of America that, that'll help us get on our way. And, and I would say they're, they're in many of our families. You know, oftentimes when we don't, we don't, we don't, um, we sometimes take it for granted, or we just think, oh, that's so-and-so, and that's so-and-so. But there, you know, it is not something that's out there, but it is in our midst. For sure. Yeah. Crystal, how about for you? What, what, are, what are some of the religious texts, practices, um, that really animate and ground your work? So I come from the Christian tradition, and when I think about my Christian faith, I think about liberation, I think about refuge and I think of restoration. And so those three tenets alone call me to this work and it makes this work look very different for me. Um, I, I'll, per, I'll say personally that I always wrestled with what it, what my faith looked like in the context of social justice. It was something that was always stirring up for me, even as like coming of age and my love of history also put that together. And so looking at specifically the black church in America and how racism impacted the the formation of the black church and also just black community and how the black church has been a refuge for for us. It has been a a place of when we were not accepted in society, we had a place. It was the place that married us, it buried us, it 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 was it was everything <laughs> i could get go deeply into it but it was everything and so to see that tradition even in my own culture to then say what does that look like now and that's been my constant question what does this look like now for us to be people of faith engaged in transforming community transforming individuals and transforming the society and what does it mean for us to put a, a, a mirror up and say these are not things that 
honor dignity, that honor humanity, that honor respect, and honor really who we are as God's children. So I think of that and I say that we must continue to do this work because everyone should be able to live a life in the image of the divine. Amen. I'm, it's also out of the Christian tradition for me. I think it's the, you know, if I take if I take Jesus seriously, Jesus calls us to love everybody, not just the folks that we like, the folks that we don't like, or the folks that challenge us, the folks that that don't look like us, the folks that, um, you know, that push us, and and so, you know, so that the totality of that certainly grounds me and challenges me and pushes me and and helps me to learn so what does it mean actually to really love everybody <laughs> um and so it's so it's an important grounding it for me i think in this work so in in what ways do faith communities add value to the fight to end mass incarceration so why why faith communities there's there's lots of great organizations that are out there that are doing some work there's some there's great Folks that are lobbying, there's great folks that are organizing. But why, why faith community? So, Chris, I'm going to start with you. Sure. So, why us? Why? Um, faith communities, the way, the way I see it, the way our organization has seen it, is that faith communities are the refuge in community. We are the moral compass in community. We are trusted in community. And so, the the theologies, the values, the those things that we summon, that we teach, that we cultivate are what impact society. And when we look at where where society is right now, our political sphere, how many of the issues that we're talking about are also deeply rooted in theology? In someone's framing of, I support this or I don't support this because my faith tradition says this or my faith tradition says that. And if we get a little bit deeper, those who are upholding these systems of oppression, of systemic racism, classism, white supremacy, privilege, those, all of those things, they're also tied to a faith community. How many of these folks are in churches, synagogues, temples, mm -hmm. every Friday, Saturday, Sunday, we have national clergy breakfasts, I mean, prayer breakfasts, right? So there is something that is either happening or not happening in those spheres that are allowing people in positions of power and those who are following them to say, you know what? This whole thing of mass incarceration, I don't think it's that bad. You know, like, because there are some bad people over here and there are some good people over there. So what would it look like if faith communities around the country change that narrative and really challenge everyone to turn a mirror to themselves and to turn a mirror to the laws and the systemic injustice that exists? What would that look like? Because we, again, are the moral compass. We are trusted. So... You know that I think we are power there. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you, thank you, Lev. I think I'll say a very similar thing in slightly different words. What we, what the, what the faith communities offer people are the sacred stories, the narrative frameworks through which we understand everything. Um, and so, people don't don't change their minds and don't make their decisions because of numbers or because of facts or because of history. They do it because of the story they see themselves as a part of. And how does that help them organize the world? Um, and so if the story is going to be one of sin and punishment, then that's going to lead to a certain kind of system. And if the story is going to be one of sin and repentance, that'll lead to a different kind of system. And so we have the potential to create the, the, the water in which we swim, to, teach, to show people the whole system can be reoriented um, if we're telling the right stories and getting them on board with them. Amen to that. Um, so my my current my current soapbox speech is that we as the faith community we are the transformation people that that we are transformation people and that to me success is not the policy in change where you know the person who has a confederate flag folds it up puts it in a box and then goes along as what changes is when that person kind of looks at the flag and says, I need to be somewhere different. You know, and not just for, for that person, but for ourselves and for others and for our communities. So the importance of being in a different 
place. And I think the I think the importance of the divine, that which is larger than us, plays an important role in this in this work. And sometimes our challenge as faith communities is we lean more on the secular than oftentimes leaning on our faith and claiming with pride, you know, the faith aspect of who we are and what we bring to the table. All right. So here's the experiment. So we're going to take, a, there's some mics on both sides. We're going to take, let's take maybe two or three questions and comments so far. Two or three questions and comments so far. So is anybody brave? Yes, come on. Well, you're here. So. Come on. Come on. So I ask this of you with a lot of respect as, um, as people who are leaders in your organizations. So full disclosure, I'm a rabbi with Roman Mu. My name is Rabbi Mira Rivera. Now, um, I am not the senior rabbi. Our senior rabbi is Rabbi David Ingber. So not being the boss, I'm curious, how do you weigh your responsibilities to your funders? And how do you craft and maneuver or push up like a geyser to get the word out, the word with big capital letters? That is a wonderful question. It's a question that we constantly wrestle with, uh, particularly at Faith in New York, because of the major influence that funders have to paid organizing, right? So one of the things that we focus on is connecting with funders who actually believe in our mission and vision. So we re we really are we really try to to discern who we even go to for funding in the first place. And also we are we make it a point to not craft our work around what the what funders are finding popular in the moment, but they root it in our values of who we are and let that be the guidepost to who is going to come in and support that? The other thing that we are are really pushing towards right now is how do we cultivate our own revenue of how do we as the people fund this? Because if we are, you know, almost a hundred percent led by funders, funders can support and funders can pull out. So with that, how do we cultivate our resource? How do each of us support that so that way we don't have funders who are telling us this is what you can do and this is what you cannot do because ultimately we are here for our community and we are grassroots led and we are here for our people so i hope that that's a good question and a good answer all right a couple of more before can I, can we I happen quickly yes go ahead I, I just say this is this is integral to the work building jewish community this is not some sideshow this is at the heart of the torah and I think our funders get that. Mm -hmm. I, I can also say one quick addition is that we've also been in conversations with our funders challenging these very systems of how funding works. So we, we've had to go back and say, hey, you know, when you fund in this kind of way, this is how you say you're supporting the work, but actually this is how you're doing it harm. So if you're really trying to support the work and you're really trying to support the movement, we need to have some other conversations. and. You know, we've been blessed to have some funders who are really about that conversation. And so, yeah. Well, and I think that as we, and I think as we get clear as organizations, congregations, kind of where we stand, the reality is we lose people. Like we, may lo we may lose some people. Um, but then you also will gain some other people. <laughs> Because you're clear, because if you start becoming wishy-washy and we start to become pretzels, <laughs> kind of in this, then we, we really don't, it, there, we're not building strong efforts, we're not building strong organizations, we're not building strong congregations. But, you know, this, if we really take this work seriously, it is not for the faint of heart. And it does not, you know, it doesn't mean that, you know, that some folks will choose not to go with us you know but but i think but i think but we have to be clear but i think we have to have those we have to have those internal conversations around 
you know, clarity and how do we hold the complexity and, 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 and challenge ourselves sometimes too in terms of broadening that, that, you know, with a sense of integrity. All right, we'll take one or two more before I, we shift into the next part. Yeah. So the question, if you didn't hear it, was how do we how do we make real connections with? And I'm assuming you're talking about people that are formerly incarcerated, yeah, folks that are yeah. folk families, um, and that that are that are bring bring those that are directly affected into our midst. Do either of you want to feel that one? Yeah, um, I'd say first of all, there are Jews in New York City who are formerly incarcerated who are desperate for a Jewish community who will welcome them, who will not turn a cold shoulder. Um, it is hard, um, but it's a, it's a goal to set, and it's a, a, a kind of uh, impetus to think about what are the systems, what are the structures, what are the values and attitudes in our congregations that uh, either put up barriers unintentionally or perhaps intentionally, um, or that can lower those barriers and make our spaces welcoming. Um, I would say get in relationship with organizations that are led by um, formerly incarcerated people that are working with them, that are taking leadership from them. Um, relationships grow organically, and so there's not a, uh, a magic bullet to, to make it happen tomorrow. Um, but if you, if you show up, um, get proximate, um, do the work, and those, those relationships will build and those people will show up. Definitely. And, you know, we believe in relational organizing. So what does it look like to also get outside of the four walls of our congregations and just be in the midst of community? Not to say, I'm going to come and help you and save you because I have the answer. Just, just look to me. But to be present, to be a listening ear to what is it that you need? What is it? How to support you and let their voice, their presence be that guidepost. I mean, so often when I think of the communities I come from, people come and go. People say that they're going to do this work. They come in, they cycle out. They parachute in, they parachute out. So how can you also do that and be there for the long haul? Mm -hmm. And I also say is let us, let us, let us, um, let us also be clear that folks are, may already be in our midst mm -hmm. and may not have may not have uh, identified themselves <laughs> as being in our midst, you know? And I think in terms of the importance of how we set a tone within our congregations, within our organizations, that sense of welcome, that sense of, uh, of being there. So I'm gonna go to the middle here. Now the rest, you're gonna have to wait the next time around because um, I'm, I'm gonna keep moving, so yes. Thank you, love. It's on. Hi. Uh, repeat. I'm a formerly incarcerated Jewish woman. I spend I spend um, all of my time speaking either at synagogues or universities. And the what I want to stress is we don't come home well. So before the fact that um, we don't have homes and we don't have jobs, we don't come home well. Mm -mm. You cannot have someone be incarcerated under the torture, the stress, uh, the trauma, and think for a minute, if you give them $30 and a Greyhound ticket, that they're gonna be okay. There must be, there's thousands of us in New York we try to help each other, and all of us are broke. So if I'm inviting you to my house, I'm giving you part of my rent money. So there has to be an awareness. We have no homes, we have no jobs, we get to have mental health once a month under Medicaid, and we have no community. So one of the things the Jewish community could do is have a rotating brunch for formerly incarcerated people at synagogues. I say this everywhere I go. I'll organize it with you. That gives us a destination, that makes us know you may be friends to us, but not only do we have to get over what it takes for us to leave the house if we have a med card. Mm -hmm. 
and by the way, I need help getting Metro cards for a full year for every formerly incarcerated person that lands in New York City. Because if we can't travel, we can't get jobs. So there is a lot we know we need. So come talk to us. All right. Well, thank, thank, and, you, thank you. And that, ver and that very system of even just transportation, how many folks are getting locked up for hopping turnstiles and getting caught into the prison industrial complex for the simple r human right of just being able to travel to work or school or home in the city? All right. So I'm going to ask you all a few questions. I'm going to pivot back to you all after I we do this um so this is the what so what can we do this is the what can we do part so for someone who's new to this work you know it's so big the school to prison pipeline parole jobs re-entry i mean what where do i start what do i do this thing is so huge where do i where do i where do i where do i start crystal where do I start? You start with yourself. Well, I've, I've been having this, this conversation last week um, around how far does legislation go versus the actual person. And again, being a, a trained educator, I gave the example of Brown versus Board of Education. So we desegregate schools, but in 2019, are schools desegregated? No, they're not. Why? Because a law does not change the human heart. It does not change our ideals. It does not change our theology. It does not, does not change the way we look at ourselves and one another. So the law is passed, but then we use, or individuals have used their own power and privilege to create their own private schools. We redline communities. We move out of other communities. We, we create our own bubble because that ideal still didn't change. So before... I would say before we get into what's the first rally I need to go to and, and what is the thing, we have to turn it on ourselves first. We have to look at how are we co-conspirators to empire? Because, you know, I can sit here and say like, yes, I'm the executive director of Faith in New York. Yes, I'm from East New York, Brooklyn. Yes, I have all these stories, but there are ways in which I spend my money there are ways in which I spend my time. There are ways in which I have held ideals that also support this, this empire, the systemic oppression. And I'll say as a caveat as well, that even broadening the conversation of like looking at mass incarceration, not just as those who are, it, who are picked up by the police and end up in prison, but also, also those who are put in detention and deportation, being two sides of the same coin. So we have to have that internal revolution. We have to educate ourselves and we have to also bring that conversation out to those who are around us. We each have a sphere of influence and we don't need a title to have that sphere of influence. We influence our children, our fleas, our communities, and we have to keep having these conversations. We can't be afraid to have these conversations. We can't be afraid to push that needle um, in order to do that. And with that, I'll say the last thing with, with what do we do first is that we eat, well, from my my faith understanding we each have giftings and talents we have time we have talent we have treasure and so where do we choose to invest these things you know if you you don't have to be at a rally marching in order to have an impact you might be someone who can support those who are directly impacted doing this work you might have giftings of strategy and communications that you can lend to an organization that is in need of those things to help move the needle. Uh, but, you know, again, if we don't start internally, if we don't do that internal transformation, laws will come and go and law laws will be interpreted in the in these lenses of oppression, white supremacy, patriarchy, you know, that kind of way. Right. Well, I'd say two things. One is just pick something and start. I think it's so easy for us to, to get stuck in paral analysis paralysis, which is the thing that's most effective, how do I get really to the source, to the root, et cetera, and then we just spend all of our times inside our own heads, because um, no place that you start is going to be the wrong place. If you pick this little corner or that little corner, it gets you started. And then when you've picked that little corner that then grabs at your heart for one reason or another, um, find the organization locally that's being led by the people most affected, um, who's been doing this work for a long time. 
Um, so Trua has looked to uh, the Shin for alternatives to isolated confinement. That's Cake, um, the folks behind the Halt Solitary Bill. Um, JFRED is really good at this. The Religion Action Center is really good at this. Um, lots of organizations are good at this. Um, so just find one. It doesn't have to be the best one. It could be the one that's nearest to you. It could be the one that you have a friend from college who happens to be involved with. Um, just start someplace. All right, thank you. Um, we just, uh, as part of our effort, have created a faith toolkit. Um, it's uh, it's www.endingmassincarceration.com. And it's a faith toolkit that is um, geared towards helping congregations that are interested in doing something. So there's a whole effort in terms around running expungement events. So we're seeing this happening more nationally where you're coordinating many governmental bodies where folks will come in for a day and get records expunged. You know, you're seeing uh, bailouts happen in other states where national bailout days where people who are stuck, you know, tends to be poor, lower income folks that are stuck in, they're, they're waiting for bail. So they're bailouts, you know, so there's other kinds of resources in this faith toolkit. It's um, www.endingmassincarceration.com. And if you go to trua.org, it's T-R-U-A-H, um, we have a handbook for Jewish communities fighting mass incarceration. I happen to have edited it. Um, <laughs> I don't think we have hard copies available anymore, but it's all available for download, and there's tons and tons of stuff there. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to go over here. There were a few hands over here. Yes. Um, I want to ask about stigma. Um, uh, I'm appreciating Evie for t speaking up, but um, having had very close personal relations involved in the criminal justice system, I know as a regular synagogue goer how extraordinarily difficult it is People do not want to hear about it. They don't want to know about it. It is not our problem. It is not anything that I can't speak for other communities, but the Jewish community is so distinctly huh, disgusted. And I think that there needs to be some kind of real change of mind about why things happen, how things happen, and how we can be... Um, not just more accepting or tolerant, but how we can really think this, how we can reframe. I know things that we're, that, that we've prioritized is trying to shift the narrative around, um, around mass incarceration and both kind of within congregations and within community. But I think that this is, you know, it is there. And I think it's, you know, I think it also speaks to why what's the opportunity for us as faith communities? Because I think we can be places, we've got language for this. We have processes for this. We have personal experiences for this. We have the resources for this to be able to shift this that we can call on, but oftentimes we, we, we don't. We default into, we let, we default into, we default into. Um, it was interesting at this conference, so I have a close friend who was incarcerated for about 20 years and we were we had one of our panel of formerly incarcerated people and it was interesting three of the four people had been formerly incarcerated but they were wrongly incarcerated and one of them was not and his critique to me is was, it was he says you know that was really good but you know you need to make sure that you have some folks that are up there that did it <laughs> you know i mean cuz the story i mean the stories that'll talk about what'll break your heart I mean, people who have been in prison for years, and they didn't do it, yeah. you know? But then the, there's the folks that have been 20 who, who did it, and they understand that they did it, and they've paid their debt. And so, you know, so I think, you know, the, the ability to really, we have to engage it. We've got to not step away from it. We need to not shy away from We need to not shy away from it. There are efforts to try to shift some of the language, but those are the places, those are, those are the opportunities for us as faith communities, we're, we're equipped to do this stuff. We're equipped to talk differently about it. We are, you know, at least in Christian circles, we're the, we're the, we're the repentance and the forgiveness people. And, and I think there are also small ways we can do it and, and signal that this is a conversation we want to have. I'll give you one small example. In my synagogue over the last couple of high holidays, I've started um, giving a, a bit of an introduction to the Mishaberach, the prayer for healing. 
and I say, um, we, we ask for healing for people who have also of needs and harm to themselves. And then I just start listing things, physical health, mental health, family problems, immigration problems, formerly incarcerated or have friends who are formerly incarcerated, depression. I just go on and on and on um, because I want to I wanna expand people's ideas of what constitutes harm and what constitutes healing in this room. Um, because we don't just have people in our synagogues who you know, have cancer or broke a hip or suffer from depression. We have people in our synagogues who have all sorts of needs, all sorts of ways in which their lives are broken. And the more we can make those visible without singling people out, but kind of expand the scope and say what's normal in this community, I think that goes away towards addressing the issue. That's great. There was another hand over here. Yep. And then we'll come back over here. And then, oh, we got to get over this side too. All right. We got, we got a little bit of time. So from, from a faith perspective, how do you reconcile being pro-life and being pro-death? Pro how do you reconcile being pro-life and being pro-death penalty? Ooh. It's a good one. That's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I always, I always uh, have questions about what does it mean to be pro-life? What does life mean? And life, life also encompass, encompasses where do, do I have access to live somewhere that's safe? Do I have access to healthcare? Do I have ha access to schools? Do I have access to things that allow me to live a full and total life? And with that access, the, the lack of access also fuels our mass incarceration system. Because for those for those who for those who did it, right? There's a reason the thing that brought you to that place. And this is I'll even just be transparent of my own uh, a transformative moment for myself, an etern eternal transformative moment. A few years ago, I was invited to go to the Brooklyn Youth Correctional Facility as a, a spoken word artist and just come do this event, we'll encourage the kids. And I held the, for a long time, I held the, the, th the, the value of you, every action has a reaction. So if you, you did something wrong, it has a consequence. And when I got in front of those kids and I see them in their jumpsuits, that whole changed for me. Because I, I looked at their lives and I'm like, one, this is right around Christmas, they're away from their families. And it made me think, you're 13 years old. What, what is happening in your community? What are the resources that are missing? What is happening in family? What is not being provided that has you? So looking at the totality of life, I, like, I have a lot of questions around all of these systems. And when it gets to the death penalty, I'll say personally, I got issues with the death penalty because of how many people have been um, falsely incarcerated and who have died by the so I'll say personally I got issues with it um, and again if we're looking at being pro-life are we pro all of the areas that actually give life or are we only looking at one small or two small areas all right good response there was a <laughs> one in the middle here and then we're going to shift over here yes a lot of times we're talking to ourselves. Mm -hmm. So my question is, when you're talking to somebody who is not in favor of reforming the mass incarceration, say a legislator and the main job provider district is the local prison, or even trying to convince your rabbi, and those are two separate things, what's the one thing that you would say as a person of faith to talk to somebody who is convinced they're right and is a supporter of mass incarceration, supporter of severe punishment. So, I, for me, I think it's I think it's always about second chances. You know, like we are, as as faith communities, like in Christian communities, you know, we're people of second chances, second and third and fourth chances, and um, and that God God loves us no matter what. Um, so those are those are core for me, I think, in those conversations. I would also say, I also want to note that one of the things we're finding about the issue of mass incarceration is that 
it's actually a bridge build. It's becoming a bridge building issue. Like you're finding folks that are conservative and progressive. You're finding folks across geography, across race. Like it's actually beginning to, it's actually, it's actually this interesting bridge building issue. You've got people on the inside. We had prosecutors, judges, you know, at the conference that, that we had pulled together, that broader set of people out there that are really invested in ending mass incarceration. And so what I also want to be careful of is to not ignore the allies that are in our midst and the unusual suspects that are in our midst and to make sure that we're paying attention. Because sometimes we, 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 we sight of even the low-hanging fruit in our midst of allies and we're ready to go, you know, you know, engage someone, you know, who's totally in a different place. So I want to encourage us to, you know, look closely around at the folks that are even in our midst that are ready to work with us. All right, there was a few over here, and then we're going to back here. All right, so I'm going to I'm going to do your question back here, and that I'm sorry that'll be the last one, and then because I have one final question. Nope, here she's coming up to the mic, right there. Yes. And then I have one final question for my colleagues. All right, I'm going to be much faster than than. Um, is it on? Just get closer to the mic. Okay. Um, I'm from Congregation Beth Elohim, and we started a dismantling racism team. And so I apologize. This is sort of an uh, uh, an answer rather than a question. And the way we began, what we did, was we started by we read. A, Michelle Alexander and Tani C. Coates and Brian Stevenson. And then we started talking about what we could do. And we realized we had lawyers in our midst. Zachary Katz Nelson, um, who was a, who knew everything about criminal law that we didn't. And <laughs> educated us about legislative efforts. And then we chose the focus. Everyone will choose their own focus. But we chose criminal justice reform because we had expertise in that issue. And then we found organizations that were doing legislative work so that we could join with them. And we found out where faith group uh, support would matter as an idea um, for a process. Um, organize with your congregation. Do house parties. Ask people what they think about current criminal justice reform efforts. Be honest, be open, let them talk. Do the rotating brunch. I want to. I want your. I want to talk to you about the rotating. All right, we're making connect that. We love that. Okay. All right. So, Lev Crystal. Yes. Share a story that broke your heart, but gives you hope. Lev. Oh, I thought you were going to let Crystal go first. Um, okay. This isn't, I think, quite heartbreaking, but I think it, it gets to the point. So. Um, but five years ago, I started doing high holiday services at my synagogue, Flatbush Jewish Center. Um, and I thought, okay, I work at Trua, I, I'm a rabbi now, um, I'm going to do a sermon on, on solitary confinement, which I thought was, was in the scheme, like a, a good way to dip a toe in the water. I thought it was a controversial sermon I could have given. Um, and I got a lot of pushback. I got at least one person who got up and left in the middle of services. Um, I had several who called the president the next day after Rosh Hashanah and, and harangued her. And so uh, I, got, I, got, I got told no more politics from the Bema. Um, but as I was carrying the Torah around, our service, getting her to put it back on the ark, I had one guy lean over to me and say, my uncle's in solitary confinement. Um, now, I'm like singing the... the, the um, so like, I can't have a conversation with him in the moment. And then he vanished, so I have no idea who he was. And at the end of services, the cantor, who is a uh, from man um, from Borough Park, um, says to me, it was a good sermon. You know, all these, all these uh, Yidin, all these Jews in solitary confinement, they face terrible anti-Semitism. It's a real issue. And I would never have pegged him for an ally in that issue. Um, so, so people are in our community, Jews of color, um, white Jews, people who, for whom this... Um, are there. We just have to, we have to um, create the conditions where the conversation can blossom and then things, I think, can move forward. So with 45's um, ICE raids a few weeks ago, we, as an organization, were just like, what do we do to protect our, our people? Because our people were are directly aligned to that. In fact, the ice raids that were happening um, in the city 
as small as they ended up being, we got word of it first because it was happening in the community of one of our congregations. So they contacted us directly. And in the process of all of that happening, I was, I was having this text conversation with one of the children of our leaders who was sharing with me how scared she was of her parents potentially being taken away from her. And I've, particularly this young, she's becoming a young woman now. I've watched, I've been, I've been at Faith in New York for over five years. I have been marching with her this whole time. She probably has done more rallies than I have. It breaks my heart because this is the cross that I'm bearing, that my parents can be taken away from me, whether it's immigration, whether it's um, policing, that there are, are children who are carrying this. As a teacher, I had students who would tell me about my brother's locked up, my father's locked up, my mom is locked up, and not seen their loved one in years. That breaks my heart. What gives me hope is that this child's parents are still fighting. They're organizing other communities. They're organizing other people. I have former students who are also pushing this narrative too. Congregations, more people who are coming into this conversation, who are coming into this work, and who are saying like, we cannot stand silent while people are being incarcerated. Not only can we not stand silent, but what can we do so that when returning citizens are back in our community, that they are seen as citizens? And fully, hu fully human before you left, you were fully human when you were there, you are fully human now. So what gives me hope is that we're here, that we're having this conversation. There are people outside of the four walls who are doing this work. And that my prayer is that one day, I will not be engaging a conversation with a child. I'm afraid that my parents may not be home when I get home from school. So. Mm, thank you. So at this uh, conference that we had in June, I had our 17 year old son with me, our oldest son. Um, this other friend I had mentioned to you who had been in, um, he had, he had been in Sing Sing and in Greenhaven about 20 years. So he was at the conference too. And at the end of the conference, this friend of mine went to my son and he said, look, I was, I was incarcerated when I was your age. That's when I made the choice that I made. And I want you to know, you know, know that, you know, each day, you know, that I have to work to, I have to work because that, and because the incarceration still lives within me, you know, I don't want you to make that same mistake. The fact that he had that conversation with my son was both the moment that broke my heart, but also gave me hope. And 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 for my son to understand, this was not kind of an abstract experience, you know, for us. But this is this is real. This is real. This is real life. This is real. Uh, real folks. Lev, Crystal, thank you so much. Thank you. Well done. Thank you all very much for indulging us. And what thank broke you. my heart is I couldn't call on all your questions, but you'll forgive me. And uh, next time. <laughs>